Before we get started, I want to let you know that this video contains discussions of police violence, including police killings. We'll also be discussing some historical accounts of lynchings. Thanks for watching, and please take care of yourself. In 2017, I was an intern for the public radio news station in St. Louis. It was a time when policing and racial justice were at the front of everyone's minds. A white police officer had shot and killed a black man named Anthony Lamar Smith after telling his partner, we're killing this MF. The police officer had been acquitted, and that led to protests breaking out all over the city. As a journalist, I really wanted to figure out how police departments could become more accountable to communities of color, and this one speech from a police chief in Texas kept running through my mind. And to those protesting for change, Brown says there's another way. We're hiring. Uh, get out that protest line and, and, and put an application in. And we'll put you in your neighborhood and help, we will help you resolve some of the problems you're protesting about. Chief Brown's speech made me wonder. Had young, progressive, black and brown people actually gone out and become police officers in the past year? And if they had, had they been able to bring about any institutional change? So I had this idea to do a profile on a couple of young officers of color in St. Louis, which was hard for me as an intern without any local connections. In St. Louis, police officers weren't allowed to talk to journalists unless they had pre-approval from the police department's media office and the police department ghosted me when I reached out to ask them for officers I could talk to. I finally made progress when I reached out to the Ethical Society of Police. So St. Louis has two police unions. There's the FOP, the Fraternal Order of Police, think old boys network that protects officers no matter what they do, and the Ethical Society of Police, which is specifically for police officers of color and argues for at least some accountability and reform. For example, they came out against that one officer getting acquitted. The Ethical Society offered me the Rojas sisters, two young Mexican-American officers who were really passionate about community policing and about this program that their union offered, which mentored new officers of color. And oh yeah, they actually were sisters. I interviewed the Rojas sisters in a quiet, windowless conference room at police headquarters. They were charming and very funny. When I told them I'd have to get my mic pretty close to their faces, Rosa, the older Rojas sister, said, well, glad I brushed my teeth this morning. They told me they were constantly aware of being Hispanic officers. They often had to serve as translators for their partners, who were mostly white police officers, and they often policed communities which were mostly black. She also thinks it's important for officers to educate themselves about communities they're not a part of. For Rosa and her sister, that includes the black community. You know, we'll sit there and watch documentaries about our um, our black history, and, and it's good to know. It's, it's good to know of the struggle and what they've get, been through, you know, and it's still there, you know, the the lack of of work. Sometimes this is where the crime starts. You have young kids out there doing crimes. It's not about pointing the finger all the time. And be like, man, you you you're doing a crime. I'm just gonna go and take you to jail. No, be able to give resource to that person and be like, hey, this I've got this program that has out there for you guys to work and, and find you a job. Call them, you know, here's this, this, you know, be able to, but you have to know this stuff. You need to know about the resource. You need to know what's out there to be able to help our communities. They also expressed genuine enthusiasm for that program from the Ethical Society that trained and mentored new officers of color. They said it had kept a lot of non-white officers, including them, from quitting when things got toxic in the department. That detail became important to the story I ended up producing because the funding for that program was in jeopardy at the time. Once I had my interview tape, I edited it together, I wrote narration to go between the interview clips, and my editor asked me to end the story with some sort of thesis statement from me. So here's what I ended up saying. Because they're willing to discuss their own backgrounds and ready to learn about groups they're not a part of, the Rojas sisters are a winning combination for improving relations between communities of color and the police. Yeah, I don't believe that anymore. 
I think my story ended up being super flawed for a number of reasons. First, it assumed that the Rojas sisters somehow represented the views of all young, non-white police officers. We just don't know that. Thinking back, I kind of wonder if the ethical society offered me the Rojas sisters and the police department approved them precisely because they were idealistic and charismatic. Two young, progressive officers of color could make it seem like policing has fewer problems than it actually does. A second flaw in my story is it assumes that that mentorship program for new officers of color the Rojas sisters mentioned somehow would make those officers, and by extension, the entire police department, less violent. Again, we just don't know that. A third flaw in my story, which kind of underlies the first two, is I made this classic journalistic assumption that police departments are basically trustworthy in terms of caring about the facts. As you'll see later on in the video, that's just not a safe assumption to make. I was so anxious to get my story out there before my internship ended that I ended up being willing to go through the police department's strict media protocols without really questioning them. I talked only to the two officers the department gave me clearance for. I didn't go back and ask them for more. I think for this story, I particularly should have asked for young black officers that both came from and policed predominantly black communities. And remember that windowless conference room where I interviewed the Rojas sisters? An officer from the police department's media office sat with us the whole time. He didn't say anything, but his presence made it clear that the Rojas sisters' speech was being monitored. I wish I'd taken the time to work around those strict policies, or that I'd at least explained them to my audience. Being a journalist, I've learned that some of the expectations of our jobs actually do a disservice toward finding the truth. Here are four things I've learned about journalism that could help us do a better job of covering the police. Quick disclaimer here that these ideas don't come originally from me. I'm doing that journalist thing where I use other people's ideas and present them in an accessible way. I'll talk about the journalists and organizations that have helped me learn these things over the years, but I want to briefly mention right up front Lewis Wallace, who wrote a book and a podcast called The View From Somewhere, which covers the history of journalistic objectivity and what that all means. I'll put a link to his book and podcast in the description. Part one, journalism takes time. It's such a common trope in journalism, working on a deadline, as in job descriptions that say, must manage multiple projects on tight deadlines. We got anything for the 6 p.m. newscast? Patrick missed a deadline. I'm so sorry, I can't be nice to you, I'm on deadline. And you know, it makes sense. Our audience wants to know what's happening quickly, especially when there's an important breaking story. And selfishly, journalists are info dumpers. We love to be the first ones to tell you about some interesting new thing. That plus, you know, making money is why newspapers come out first thing in the morning and why you see those flashy car crashes as advertisements for the five o'clock news. In my corner of journalism, public radio, this means that lots of local public radio stations have daily talk shows about local politics and culture, and I've tempted a couple of these shows. They're fun. My coworkers were cool and ambitious. Everybody pitches their ideas, and then we all scramble to book guests and write scripts for the next day's show. But that deadline pressure of trying to put an hour or even two hours of interviews live on the radio every day meant that we were under a lot of pressure to find people to talk to. We often relied on the same few experts who were good talkers and were willing to come on on a moment's notice. And then of course there are those people who, for some special reason, get in touch with us and ask to be on the show on a given day. There was this one time when I was temping at the morning shift, that was the daily show on WBEZ Chicago at the time, when my boss came over to my desk and said, hey Char, can you produce an interview with the county sheriff, Tom Dart? He has a new podcast about the opioid epidemic, and he's coming on the show tomorrow to talk about it. I looked it up, and indeed, the sheriff's department did have a new podcast on their website dedicated to interviewing survivors of the opioid epidemic, 
both in and out of the county jail. When I was writing notes for our host, I made sure to include questions about why the jail population of nonviolent opioid addicts was so high in our county. And I also had them play a clip from the podcast where a woman in our county jail expressed her unfiltered thoughts. I feel crappy about the thought that there are plenty of individuals going through depression and anxiety because their family members are losing their, their lives, mother, father, sisters, and brothers, and worst of all children, due to the outbreak of heroin use and prescription medications. When he came on our show, Sheriff Tom Dart, to his credit, was clear-eyed about how bad the opioid problem is in Chicago. He acknowledged that his jail, the Cook County Jail, runs the largest drug treatment program in the county. And he also said this. If you have an addiction issue, a substance abuse issue, you have a mental health issue, you do not belong in a criminal justice system at all. Under any circumstances, you don't. I'm glad he said this. And I'm glad he said this in public, where lawmakers who could actually make these policy changes might be listening. But I still felt weird about producing this interview. Tom Dart came on our show because he had a podcast to promote. Our constant need for guests meant that he got to come on our show on his terms when he knew he'd have the best optics. I think that to do more thorough journalistic work, we shouldn't stress deadlines and output as much as we do. Unless there's an emergency, of course. If I'd had more than one day to produce that interview with the sheriff, I might have tried to find some of those women in his podcast, or maybe their families, to hear their stories more directly. I might have done some more research on the opioid epidemic so I could have written more incisive questions. I have the same feeling about my interview with the Rojas sisters back in St. Louis. I could have done a more thorough job of finding black police officers to talk to. I could have visited with some of the people in the districts the Rojas sisters policed and asked them about their interactions with officers. I could have even asked for a ride along with an officer so I could have seen community police interactions firsthand. As it stands now, I have basically no personal experience interacting with police officers. And that brings me to the second thing I've learned about journalism. Part two. Journalism requires closeness with the communities you're reporting on. Hold on tight, because we're going back in time to 1892. Ida B. Wells, through a combination of her incredible intelligence and resilience, plus a small fraction of the resources she deserved, has gone from being born into slavery to working as a teacher, acquiring an education at a Freedmen's College, and helping raise her siblings after their parents died. She's gained some notoriety as a newspaper columnist, too, and she's recently become the editor-in-chief of the Free Speech, a black newspaper in Memphis, Tennessee. She's on the road selling subscriptions when she gets terrible news from home. Three of her close friends, Thomas Moss, William Stewart, and Calvin McDowell, had been lynched by a white mob. The three men ran the People's Grocery, a staple of the black community, and had defended their store after a racially charged riot had broken out on the block. They'd shot and wounded a group of white men in their store and black business owners wounding white men was something the white public in Memphis could not handle. The sheriff deputized a white mob, which allowed them to, without interruption, drag Moss, Stewart, and McDowell to the edge of town and shoot them dozens of times. Before this moment, Ida B. Wells had certainly been aware of lynchings, particularly of black people, but She'd believed this commonly accepted idea at the time that lynchings were this sort of natural reaction to a heinous crime, particularly the rape of a white woman by a black man. But this lynching just didn't fit that commonly accepted framework. Moss, Stewart, and McDowell were respected men in their community, and they hadn't been accused of any crime. She wondered if the white rage that led to her friends being lynched was mostly because her friends ran a successful black-owned business that competed for customers with a white-owned grocery store down the street. And she wondered if other lynchings happened for reasons similar to this one. 
So she traveled around the South. She counted the number of lynchings in each state. She talked to people who knew the victims to get a better sense of what the true motives might have been. Keep in mind, Ida B. Wells was the first person to do this. According to investigative journalist Nicole Hannah-Jones, Great investigative reporters, when we think about using data to back up our claims, not just relying on anecdotes, but being able to back that up with data, you have to think about Ida B. Wells uh, because she is one of the first journalists in this country to use those techniques. And Wells's results shocked everyone. She found that only a third of lynchings involved even the accusation of rape, much less a conviction. Other reasons people got lynched included political causes, five, disputing, one, disobeying quarantine regulations, two, slapping a child, one, protecting a Negro, one, to prevent giving evidence, one, knowledge of larceny, one, writing letter to white woman, one, asking white woman to marry, one, jilting girl, one, having smallpox, one, concealing criminal, two, threatening political exposure, one, self-defense, six, unknown cause, 92, no cause, 10. To get an idea of how radical this all was, keep in mind that most journalists simply took the word of a lynch mob. Here's an example of the New York Times reporting on a lynching in 1890. Macon, Georgia, October 18th. Willie Singleton, colored, aged about 20 years, was lynched in the outskirts of the city at a late hour last night for an attempted assault on a young lady, the daughter of a prominent citizen of Macon. A few days ago, Singleton was arrested at Eufaula, Alabama, and an officer started with him for Macon. But when a few miles from the city yesterday, an armed party stopped the train and took the prisoner. Last night, the Negro was taken before his victim and fully identified. The mob then took him to the woods where the assault had been committed and, hanging him to a tree and riddling his body with bullets, left it swinging with a placard bearing the inscription, Our women are protected. They must and shall be safe. All present took an oath not to reveal the name of the young lady. Today, the coroner held an inquest over the dead body of Singleton. The jury returned a verdict that he came to his death at the hands of a person or persons unknown to the jury. Ida B. Wells' journalism shattered the idea that lynchings were a public outpouring of rage after a heinous crime. In fact, they were a pattern of anti-black terrorism directed at anyone who was viewed to be too powerful or too secure. My point here is that because she was close to the story, because the lynching of her friends just didn't fit into that commonly accepted paradigm, Ida B. Wells covered this story in a way that other journalists hadn't thought to do. In journalism, there's this idea that reporters need some emotional distance from a story in order to get at some objective truth. But trying to distance reporters from their stories leads to situations like Lewis Wallace, a trans journalist, not being able to report on trans communities when he worked at WBEZ Chicago, or Brenda Salinas, a Latina journalist who wasn't allowed to cover immigration news when she worked at KUT in Austin, Texas. Think of all the important stories that these reporters had unique access to and a unique perspective on had they been allowed to report them. Even if journalists don't have direct personal connections to the stories they cover, I still think the best Journalism happens when community members who are directly affected by the stories get a say in the reporting. Remember how Ida B. Wells essentially invented data journalism in order to get a better picture of what was going on with lynchings? Well, in 2014, a Washington Post reporter named Wesley Lowry actually started counting and collecting data on police shootings, but only after Black Lives Matter activists lambasted the media on Twitter and urged them to prove something that they already knew, that black people experience police violence at a rate extremely disproportionate to white people. Some of the most interesting journalism projects I've seen directly encourage the public to participate. The Invisible Institute, right down the road from me, has created a database of complaints against police officers. 
The database is searchable, so if you've had an interaction with a police officer that didn't go well, you can look up their record easily online. Outlier Media, an organization in Detroit, actually texts people who might not have a computer or access to Wi-Fi to see if they have any questions, particularly about home prices and predatory mortgages, a really important issue in poor neighborhoods. When I was preparing my interview with the Rojas sisters, I wish that I had reached out to Black Lives Matter activists in St. Louis. I could have asked them what their questions were about young police officers of color. I already followed the strict media policies of the St. Louis Police Department, including activists' questions in my story, would only have made it more balanced. And while I'm talking about collaborations between journalists and the communities they cover, I should note that there's some great journalism out there being done by people who aren't professional journalists. City Bureau, a kind of news lab here in Chicago, trains people from all age groups and backgrounds to become what they call documenters, people who they pay a stipend to show up at public meetings, take notes, and record their own questions about what goes on there. WYSO, or WISO, a radio station in Ohio that I used to work for, has a program called Community Voices, where they train interested community members about how to make radio stories, and then they let them work as freelancers, covering stories that the professional journalists at the station might not have thought of. Of course, sometimes reporting comes from people who don't have any journalism training at all but who see an important event and take it upon themselves to document it. Had Darnella Frazier not filmed the killing of George Floyd on her phone, it would have been a lot harder to break that story. Part 3. Journalism involves telling powerful people they're wrong. The murder of George Floyd might not have been proven without Darnella Frazier's video, because this was the press release from the Minneapolis Police Department about the incident. Man dies after medical incident during police interaction. May 5th, 2020, Minneapolis. On Monday evening, shortly after 8 p.m., officers from the Minneapolis Police Department responded to the 3700th block of Chicago Avenue South on a report of a forgery in progress. Officers were advised that the suspect was sitting on top of a blue car and appeared to be under the influence. Two officers arrived and located the suspect a male believed to be in his 40s, in his car. He was ordered to step from his car. After he got out, he physically resisted officers. Officers were able to get the suspect into handcuffs and noted he appeared to be suffering medical distress. Officers called for an ambulance. He was transported to Hennepin County Medical Center by ambulance, where he died a short time after. At no time were weapons of any type used by anyone involved in the incident. See the lies by omission here? Those nine or ten minutes before George Floyd got into the ambulance were crucial. And of course a weapon wasn't used. Derek Chauvin killed George Floyd with his body. Darnella Frazier's video debunks that police report. Just like the scientific consensus debunks climate change deniers, just like that meat in a jar experiment debunks the theory of spontaneous generation. And this has happened so many times. Police reports have been debunked but only after reporters have taken them to be reliable sources and used them in their stories. Wire services like the Associated Press, the AP, are often the first to break these stories, but they're only beginning to realize that police department media press releases are intended to protect officers, not to tell the truth and can't be treated as reliable. I still see reporters presenting police department press releases without any fact-checking, and I still see speeches presented by police chiefs and other government officials presented on TV or radio in their entirety. I don't want to do any more stories about police officers or other public officials without another voice giving a second opinion or my own corrections of any misinformation. This will probably take a lot longer, and probably will get some pushback from people who think that police press releases should be trusted as part of telling a balanced story or whatever. But when public officials get facts wrong, that's not their opinion or their side of the story. That's misinformation, 
and reporters need to come right out and say that. Chip Mitchell is a veteran reporter for WBEZ covering Chicago's south and west sides. During the uprisings in 2020 that followed the murder of George Floyd, Chip was covering mostly poor, mostly black neighborhoods in Chicago. Lots of people were breaking in and stealing stuff from stores in those neighborhoods at the time, and Chip noticed two competing media narratives about this. One from right-wing media organizations like Fox News was that these looters were extremist Black Lives Matter activists who wanted chaos. And according to liberal city officials like Mayor Lori Lightfoot and our progressive prosecutor Kim Fox, the looters were a criminal gang of outside agitators. The next morning, we need all people. Mayor Lightfoot is at a press conference. She attributed the neighborhood looting to, quote, a criminal element. To and David Brown, the police superintendent, he was, he was next to her. I was on the ground in the field, and I watched these looters strategically. He talked about the neighborhood looters as criminal rings that were outsmarting the police. Flank our officers and hit the target they intended. Kim Fox talked about how her office was working with federal agencies to hold outside agitators accountable. This is what they do. They go and, and they agitate. But in the neighborhoods he was covering, Chip observed something different. I saw one scene after another. Cell phone shops, pharmacies, liquor stores, looting that was involving a lot of people. Find it, made it to a stretch um, around 76th and Ashland. A couple big grocery stores, biggest grocery stores in the neighborhood. One's an Aldi's, the other's a Walmart. Men and women of all ages grabbing a shopping cart, going in there, coming out with the cart full, packed, unloading the cart into their car and going back for more. Hundreds of people, mothers and fathers, taking advantage of the situation, yes, but also getting a lot of stuff that maybe they don't have a, a chance in normal times, if we can call it normal, um, to fill up a cart at Walmart, and they were going to do it this time. And, and I would see a mother with a cart full of food and household essentials. You know, she wasn't going for electronics, and a younger woman was helping her unload it into the back of the car. One family after another, hundreds of people involved with this. It was a sight to behold. The people who looted weren't extremist protesters, but they weren't outside agitators either. They were ordinary Chicagoans who had desperate needs, and they used this moment of unrest to fill those needs in any way they could. Chip says this explicitly in his reporting, and he says there's a deeper truth he thinks that city officials aren't admitting. So I, I try to make sense of this, you know, why public officials are focusing on this idea that the looting was organized by outsiders when what I saw in broad daylight for hours and hours on Sunday was just the opposite. I don't know, I'm not in their heads, but I think it's just easier to think about looting as a problem that can be solved by arresting a few people or a few dozen people rather than as an upheaval tied to poverty and desperation. I think it's easier to conduct criminal investigations than to come up with investment for these communities, investment on a scale that would make them less volatile and less violent and that would also avert repeats of the unrest we've seen over this last week. I only wish that Chip had included some recommended reading about how we might undo it. Which brings me to part four. Journalists should present lots of potential solutions to civic problems, including abolitionist solutions. I became a journalist for the same reasons that I wanted to be a teacher or a librarian when I was younger. I wanted to help people learn more about the world. I know it's important that journalists teach people about what's wrong right now, but I think another part of journalism should be teaching people about the possibilities for what could fix things in the future. I've seen a lot of reporting that says that some people want to abolish or defund the police, but I haven't seen much reporting that goes into detail about what that would look like, and talks to experts about what it would entail to get there. I think we should give audiences a fuller picture of all the possibilities when it comes to the future of public safety, 
And that includes the possibility of defunding or abolishing the police. For journalists, this should not mean a direct call to action or advocating for one potential possibility over another. But I have heard some really good reporting about policy proposals from prominent politicians where experts and advocates from many different perspectives come in and hash out the details of, say, Joe Biden's campaign pledges about climate change. I guess I'd like to see the same kind of expert analysis and debate on certain activist proposals, like, say, Eight to Abolition or Black Lives Matter's formal list of demands. In my future work, I'd love to follow up on some great local reporting that's been done on programs like restorative justice groups for teens, changing state laws on cash bail, gun control, immigration enforcement, and on neighborhood clubs like Mothers Against Senseless Killings, which basically held a block party every day for an entire summer and experienced no shootings on their block. I'd love to know more about how people feel about these programs, how many resources they need, are they scalable? And could they be part of a future public safety plan that reduces the need for police? I realize that most of you watching this video probably are not journalists yourselves, and you might be wondering, how can I get involved in this issue? Well, if you have the time and interest, and you live near a community journalism program like Community Voices or City Bureau, join up, get trained. Journalism is a practice, not just a profession and we'd love to have your help. You can go to the website of your local newspaper or news stations and see if any of the reporters there have email addresses in their bios. You can send them questions you have or connect them to people they should talk to in their coverage. Or you can criticize us on social media as Black Lives Matter activists have done so successfully over the years. As Wesley Lowry said, journalists are remarkably thin-skinned. We care a lot about what our audiences think of us and our work, and we probably will at least think critically about what you have to say. Anything to get us closer to the truth. Thank you so much for watching. I know that my previous video about Brian David Gilbert brought a lot of new people and subscribers to my channel. If you're new here, please introduce yourself in the comments, and I'll see you again very soon.